Many years ago, the Indian subcontinent was known to be the treasure chest of the world. The mineral rich lands that yielded the finest of stones attracted many accomplished designers and craftspeople, including Cartier. Indian royal families have been royally flaunting their massive wealth through their breathtaking forts, palaces, and jewelry. From Kashmiri sapphires to Golconda diamonds, the Indian royals have seen and owned it all. Welcome to Gems and Jewelries and another episode of Destination Jewels. In this episode, we are making a stop in the beautiful country of India, famous for its flamboyant jewels and extravagant taste. When it comes to jewelry, the Mughals made a splash. Considered one of the most important Mughal rulers, Shah Jahan ascended the throne in 1627 after the death of his father. Shah Jahan ruled from 1628 to 1658, a period regarded as the golden age of the Mughal Empire, and his reign witnessed the development of the most significant examples of Mughal architecture and design. The Taj Mahal is the best known symbol of Shah Jahan's commitment to high Mughal architecture. The mausoleum was built as a tribute to his wife following her death during childbirth. The Asaf Jahi dynasty was founded by Mir Kamar Uddin Siddiqui, a viceroy of the Deccan under the Mughal Empire from 1713 to 1721. He intermediately governed the region after the death of the sixth Mughal Emperor in 1707. By the time of his annexation, Hyderabad was the largest and most prosperous of all the princely states. The jewels of the Nizams of Hyderabad state represent one of the largest and most expensive collection of jewels in present-day India. Upinda Singh ruled the princely state of Patiala from 1900 to 1938 and was best known for his extravagant lifestyle. Only nine years old when his father died in 1900, he inherited some of the most incredible jewels of the time, including the De Beers yellow diamond of approximately 234.50 carats, which he later had mounted by Cartier, and a Grand Western style diamond set tiara. India's rich history is dripping in wealth and opulence. Such was the power and might of Indian royalty that European jewelers would fly down to cater to them. In fact, the Patiala necklace remains the largest commission ever received by Cartier. Interestingly, Wally Simpson, the then Duchess of Windsor, had to return a diamond emerald necklace to Harry Winston when it became known that her jewels had once graced Maharani Sita Devi's feet as anklets. Join me as we explore some of the most exquisite jewels owned by the royal families of India. Created by Cartier in 1931, this Patiala ruby choker was a magnificent creation made with rubies, pearls and diamonds, all set in platinum. The upper part consisted of six layers of rubies with diamonds as well as pearls on the sides. The center part contained rubies with pearls, while the lowermost part of the necklace was the heaviest of all with pearls and diamonds. Commissioned by Maharaja Bhupinder Singh in 1931, this necklace cemented his relationship with the House of Cartier. Currently, only the upper choker has survived the passage of time and has been restored by Cartier. The Maharaja of Nawanga was famed for his opulent jewels, including the famed but lost 500 carat Nawanga necklace recreated for the Ocean's movie and the lemon yellow tiger's eye diamond. One such piece that gives a peek into India's rich heritage was created by Cartier in the now famous Art Deco style with 17 rectangular Colombian emeralds weighing a total of 277 carats. The 70 carat central emerald is this piece that was said to belong to the Sultan of Turkey. Maharaja Dulip Singh, 
the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire, owned an impressive diamond sepric, an accessory that is made for the turban. The three plumes are entirely made of diamonds, with a dazzling emerald placed right in the center. A three-tiered diamond necklace, consisting of the impressive 128 karat star of the South Diamond. This necklace, belonging to Maharani Sita Devi of Baroda, is incredible. It also flaunts the 78.5 karat English Dresden Diamond. The Star of the South is the famed pinkish brown cushion cut diamond, which was originally discovered in Brazil in 1938 at 261.88 carats and sold for a measly $3,000 by the mine owner. Years later, the necklace was purchased by Rustam G of Bombay and sold to the house of Cartier in 2002. The Patiala necklace, owned by Maharaja Bupinda Singh of Patiala, Blunted the seventh largest diamond in the world. This 234 carat yellow diamond by De Beers was mined in South Africa in 1888. The Maharaja was just 34 when he decided to turn the De Beers diamond into an heirloom piece and commissioned Cartier to make a ceremonial necklace with the diamond as his centerpiece. The necklace was finally made in 1928 and it became known as the Patiala necklace. It has five rows of platinum embellished with 2,930 diamonds and a few Burmese rubies. It mysteriously disappeared around 1948, only to be rediscovered without the central diverse diamond and the Burmese rubies half a century later by Cartier. Sitting proudly at over 500 carats, this magnificent necklace is a proud tale of India's obsession with jewels and Cartier's craftsmanship. Commissioned in 1931, the Nawanaga necklace is one of India's most famous and finest jewels, so much so that it was immortalized with a recreation in a Hollywood movie won by Anne Hathaway in Ocean's 8. The necklace flaunts two strands of first-class white diamonds linked on both sides by a pair of square pink diamonds. The center pendant comprised several pink diamonds, a large 28 carat blue diamond, a 12 carat green diamond, and the famous 136 carat Queen of Holland diamond. Sadly, the necklace no longer exists, except in old photos. Belonging to the Nizams of Hyderabad, this diamond revering necklace these eight large impressive diamonds between 10 to 15 carats dazzle with fineness. The modified brilliant cut of these diamonds reflects the advancement of gem facetting in India. Additionally, the open work setting and symmetrical nature of the necklace design directly results from Western influence. The Shah Jahan owned one of the most impressive spinels I've ever seen. This ring flaunts a fluted spinel half bead, blue enamel, and gold. The spinel is dated 1643 to 44, and the ring around late 19th or early 20th century. Taken by General Robert Bell, after Tipu Sultan's defeat by the British in May 1799, the definitive meaning of the numerals on this box has eluded scholars to date. The numerals are 11, 20, 21, 31, 41, 51, 61, 71, 81, 91, 101, 201, 202, 301, 401, 501, 601, 701, 801, and 901. It is considered most likely that they represent complex mathematical equations based on those of ancient Greek. 
While I don't know the exact purpose of this unique and extraordinary box, we can all agree that it's phenomenal and the mystery adds to its allure. Ceremonial swords often symbolized power and military powers. They could also be placed on the throne to signify the presence of a ruler or be used to solemnize a wedding ceremony in the royal court by standing in for the absent groom. This sword follows the Mughal tradition of encrusted edged weapons, although the form of the hilt is strongly influenced by European small swords, which were fashionable in the 19th century. Probably used by a royal patron, this impressive gem set bow with cover and stand is a rare example of a complete drinking vessel set to have survived from Mughal India. It features rubies, enamel, diamonds, gold and stylized motifs. Birds were considered a symbol of royalty at the Mughal court and at other provincial states in India. The Mughal emperor Jahanji mentions being gifted a gem encrusted bird. This gem set an enameled parrot standing on a similarly decorated base is closely related to another known jeweled parrot. Both birds were probably made as a pair and were originally in the collection of the Nizams of Hyderabad. They were apparently part of a group of birds that were placed around the throne during Dobha ceremonies. In December 1905, Maharaja Singh of Kapathala visited Paris before heading to the royal wedding of King Alfonso VIII and Princess Victoria Eugenia of Battenberg in Madrid. The Maharaja was an important client of the jewelry houses of Place Vendôme and went looking for spectacular jewels worthy of a royal wedding. Inside the Malaria boutique, he discovered this magnificent enamel and diamond peacock agrates. It features rose cut diamond, blue, green, yellow and gold brown enamel and 18 karat gold. Don't you agree that India boasts one of the most incredible jewels from the vaults of any royalty around the world? From embellished objects to downright incredible jewels, this proud civilization tells the tale of unparalleled luxury. Let me know your favorite in the comment section below. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a video. That's all I can cover in this video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.